name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Mother most sorrowful. Pray for us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. The promises of those devoted to the seven sorrows and tears of Our Lady um, were given to us by Our Lady through, um, through St. Bridget of Sweden, whose feast day is today, by the way. And Our Lady directly reveals that the amazing grace is granted by her Son for all those who daily pray seven Hail Marys while meditating on her seven dolors or sorrows and tears. She says, I will grant peace to their families. Now, I'm sure the people whose kids are running around, ah, you know, the people would like to hear that one. They will be enlightened by the divine mysteries. In other words, they will receive graces to understand the things that, that have to do with the divine mysteries. She says, I will console them in their pains and I will accompany them in their work. I will give them as much as they ask for as long as it does not oppose the adorable will of my divine son or the sanctification of their souls. In other words, through this devotion, you can get pretty much anything out of her that you want. I will defend them in their spiritual battles with the infernal enemy, and I will protect them at every instance of their lives. So this is one of the primary um, devotions that exorcists uh, start to foster so that they um, have a great deal of um, spiritual protection. I will visibly help them at the moment of their death. They will see the face of their mother. And by that, she's referring to Our Lady. So if you have a very strong devotion to Our Lady of Sorrows, um, and I've um, seen this in certain cases where the person right before they die, their face will change. They see, they'll say something like, beautiful, and then they die, type of thing. Um, I, ha I have obtained this grace from my Divine Son that those who propagate this devotion to my tears and dolors will be taken directly from this earthly life to eternal happiness, so it's a get out of purgatory free card, since all their sins will be forgiven and my son will be their eternal consolation and joy. St. Alphonsus Liguri testifies to complimentary revelations given by our Lord to St. Elizabeth of Hungary, where he further promises four special graces. The first is that those who before their death invoke the Blessed Mother in the name of her sorrows should obtain true repentance of all their sins. So this devotion helps a person to remain penitent and to, and to always be sorry for their sins. That he would protect in their tribulation, he, referring to God, would protect in their tribulations all who remember this devotion and that he would protect them especially at the hour of death. That he would press upon their minds the remembrance of his passion and that they should have their reward for it in heaven that he would commit such devout souls to the hands of Mary so that she might obtain for these souls all the graces she wanted to lavish upon them. In other words, if you have somebody in your family who you think needs a little bit more grace, if you commit them to the hands of Our Lady of Sorrows, she'll very often give those, that person the graces necessary to lead better lives. Before I go into the actual sorrows of Our Lady, which, of which there are seven, I want to talk a little bit about Our Lady herself which will help you to understand the sorrows a bit more. In philosophy, we say that the, there is a principle, St. Thomas delineates it, he says, the body adjusts itself to the operations of the soul. And what this basically means is, is this. As you perform ver acts of virtue, the body starts to, the material disposition, your body, literally starts to arrange, to accommodate that kind of activity of virtue. And vice is also, the, it also does the same thing for vice. If you're committing vice, the body starts adjusting to, to that. The body is actually designed for acts of virtue, so what happens is because you commit vices, the body begins to break down. So this is because it's just not designed to sustain that kind of a thing. And you'll actually see this. You know, you go to these convents where the nuns have been leading very holy lives. You know, they're in their 70s or 80s, and they have this glow about them, which is... Um, something that, that, you know, again, the body starts adjusting itself. You know, they, they look young, you know, they're 80 years old and they look like they're, you know, 40 type of thing. Our Lady was a woman of perfect virtue. Her entire life was a case of constant growth in virtue. Her entire life. And so her body was perfectly disposed to the operations of virtue. 
Now, as we, as we grow in virtue, the body becomes more acute. Sin dulls us, right? It dulls our senses. And the, the graver the sins we commit, the more dull we become intellectually and physiologically in relationship to certain things. And so, Our Lady being um, someone of perfect virtue, she had perfect acuity in relationship to her physical body so she could sense things and, t and, and feel things much more acutely and interiorly because her emotions were perfectly subordinated to reason because she had perfect virtue. It meant that her emotional life was actually more intense than ours. She could feel pain much more acutely or joy or delight much more acutely than we can. Sin, as I mentioned, causes a dullness of sense or a blindness or dullness of the intellect. But Our Lady was sinless and therefore suffered no dullness. She could therefore feel more keenly. And so when, her, her, when she looks at this, the, the, the sorrows, the things that she's going to sorrow about, she sees these evils, her suffering interiorly is far more intense than we can even comprehend because of the fact that she's much more acute. So that being understood, when you start, you know, because for us, I think we kind of meditate, you know, oh, it would be terrible to watch her son die. You, 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 I mean, as you'll see when we get to that stage, what she's going through interiorly is on a completely different kind of a level than most people would even comprehend. So I want to go into the first four sorrows in this conference, and then we'll deal with the um, um, sorrows five through uh, seven in the next. The first sorrow is the prophecy of Simeon. We read in Scripture in Luke 2, 34 and following, And Simeon blessed them and said to his mother, Mary his mother, Behold, this child is set for the fall and the resurrection, or the rise, of many in Israel, and for a sign which shall be contradicted. And thy own soul a sword shall pierce, that out of many hearts thoughts may be revealed. And why does Our Lady sorrow in this? The Blessed Virgin Mary herself told Saint Matilda that on this announcement of Saint Simeon, all her joy was changed into sorrow. For as it was revealed to Saint Teresa, though the Blessed Mother had already knew that the life of her son would be sacrificed for the salvation of the world, yet she then learned more distinctly and in greater detail the sufferings and cruel death that awaited her son. She knew that he would be contradicted And this contradiction would be in everything he would do. He would be contradicted in his doctrines. For instead of being believed, he would be esteemed as a blasphemer for teaching that he was the Son of God. <clears throat> contradicted in his reputation, for he was of noble, even of royal descent, and was despised as a peasant. So as we read in scripture, is this not the carpenter's son? He was wisdom itself and was treated as ignorant, as a false prophet. He was treated as a madman, as a drunkard, a glutton, and a friend of sinners, even as a sorcerer. Because he's, you know, he was told, you know, it's by the power of Beelzebub that you cast out Satan, or cast out the demons. As a heretic, and possessed by an evil spirit, in a word, Jesus was considered so notoriously wicked that as the Jews said to Pilate, no trial was necessary to condemn him. He was such a bad man in their eyes. St. Alphonsus Liguri says that Mary already knew all these torments that her son was to endure, but all the minute circumstances of the sufferings, internal and external, that were to torment her, her Jesus in his passion or made known to her as our Lord revealed to St. Teresa, she consented to all with the constancy which filled even the angels St. Alphonse says, with astonishment. So when she would embrace her suffering and, ex and remain constant in doing the right thing and remaining virtuous through the worst situation, even the angels were astonished by it. Our Lord is revealing that Our Lady is the one to go to for secret knowledge. Your soul shall be pierced so that the thoughts of many will be laid bare. What our Lord is revealing through St. Simeon is, is that if there is something that you need to know that's hidden, you go to her specifically under the title of Our Lady of Sorrows, and she will reveal it to you. It works like clockwork. I do it all the time. Now, you don't go to find out what's our neighbors doing. You know, 
But if like you have a son or a daughter and you're concerned about them and you think that there, there's something wrong there, you can ask, what are we dealing with? Or even in your own life, if, you, if it's very helpful to pray to Our Lady of Sorrows to reveal your own defects, because a lot of times the predominant defect is not the one that's the most seen. The rise of many. Our Lady is the one to go to ask for the conversion of those of our family members by blocking demons and giving grace. Whenever you're trying to get somebody to convert or when you're trying to get somebody to start leading a better life, there's two sides, but there's a positive and a negative. The, the negative side is you've got to get the demons out of their lives so that they don't block the operations of grace and, and influence the individual. And then you also have to pray for the grace of the person for their conversion or for them to start leading a moral life. But Our Lady, under the title of Our Lady of Sorrows, is the one to go to through, for those kinds of graces. The ruin of many. Our Lady knew that there would be many who would not follow her son. And so you can even go to her when you find that some family members or some aren't following her son. Just say, you know, bring, bring them to him, you know, to, to, her, to your son. The second sorrow is the flight into Egypt. Herod ordered all children under the age of two to be put to death. He meant serious business. He wanted the death of who was to become king. Now, of course, he thought in terms of earthly kingship, but he actually wanted the death of the Christ child, the Messiah. This is Our Lady's first aspect of this particular sorrow, that Herod or others would want to put her son to death, and yet she knew how perfect he was, how lovable, amiable he was, and how good he was. He was no sooner born then men were already trying to put him to death, the very men who he would save. Anyone may imagine that Mary must have suffered on this journey from uh, you know, Bethlehem to, to Egypt. To Egypt, the distance was great. Most authors agree that it was about 300 miles, so that it was a journey of upwards of 30 days because of the nature of the terrain and that type of thing. The road was, according to St. Bonaventure, described as rough, unknown, and little frequented. It was in the winter season, so it would have been you know, difficult on that level. So they had to actually tra uh, travel in snow, rain, and wind, and through rough and dirty roads, and that type of thing. St. Bonaventure asks, how did they obtain their food? Where did they repose at night? How were they lodged? What can they eat? but a piece of hard bread or something like that, or either brought by St. Joseph or begged his alms. In other words, what they would have, just the, on the sustenance level, it would have been difficult. Where could they have slept on such a road? Especially on the 200 miles of desert where there were neither houses nor inns, as authors tell us. Unless on the sand or under a tree, St. Bonaventure says, exposed to the air and the dangers of robbers and wild beasts with which Egypt abounded. Had one met these three greatest personages in the world, for whom could he have taken them but for three poor wandering beggars through the desert? It was a great physical suffering for St. Joseph and Our Lady. And remember, for her, she feels things more acutely, so it's a physiologically it's a harder thing for her to deal with than it would be for us. But Our, Maid, Our Lady interiorly manifested perfect confidence that is, trust in God's protection of her son and the protection of them from the wrath of Herod. In God's providence in that moment, in his will and in his wisdom of what they were doing. In other words, she had perfect confidence. God knows what he's doing. You know, he revealed to St. Joseph, I'm not going to argue with him. I'm not gonna, we're not going to discuss it. We're just going to do it type of thing. How different this is from us who when even the slightest thing goes wrong, we get angry with God. We distrust his providence. We don't think he really knows what he's doing. I know better. And we question his will. We even deny his wisdom. That kind of a thing. So there's a, there's a real difference where her confidence is never shaken. It's never even, you know, there's this perfect constancy through the whole thing. There's the threefold purity of Our Lady. Now, the authors tell us there's three kinds of purity. The first is physical purity, so you never violate the Sixth Commandment in relationship to your state in life. The second is mental purity, which is never violation of the Ninth Commandment. 
<coughs> but then there is a purity, the third kind of a purity, which is very different. Everything that's created in a relationship to God is imperfect, and in a certain sense, impure, in the sense, not that it's evil, but impure in the sense that God is purity itself. He's pure goodness, pure knowledge, pure truth. There's absolutely no admixture of any impurity whatsoever. So the third level of purity is one in which the person's mind never allows anything into it that is not God. So the third level of purity is one in which the, the intellect and will and the soul of the individual remains absolutely pure, being fixed on purity itself. God never deviates. Everything it does is under the aspect of God, and that's part of that's driven by charity. So charity is loving God and loving our neighbor for the sake of God. So that being the case, it's always under the aspect of God. St. Thomas calls that the formality of faith, the formality of the virtues in which you're always doing them under the aspect of God. And so this purity she had is one how Our Lady was never self-absorbed. We'll talk about that when we get to the fifth sorrow. It did not matter at all all what was happening to her. She never focused on herself. It was pure focus on God and on her son. So she was never self-absorbed, but totally taken with God and never considered anything under the aspect of, except under that of God. She was never selfish, selfish in, her, in her suffering. And by that we mean all the aspects of that. Complaining, you know, thinking to yourself, how long is this going to last? How much do I have to put up with? None of that. In the third sorrow, there is the loss of Jesus in the temple. There are some who assert, and not without reason, that this sorrow was not only one of the greatest, but in a certain sense the greatest and most painful of all. But I think that's only true under a certain aspect, but I think it's worth looking at. For in the first place, Mary and her other sorrows had Jesus with her. All the other sorrows, he was, he was there with her. She suffered when St. Simeon prophesied to her in the temple. She suffered in the flight into Egypt, but still in the company with Jesus. But in this sorrow she suffered far from Jesus, not knowing where he was. Her suffering in this sorrow was the, uh, the sorrow of separation from her son who was so perfect, good, and loving and brought her constant joy. In the second place, Mary and all her other sorrows well understood their cause in relationship to the redemption of the world, that is the divine will. She understood that her son had to go through these things to save mankind. But in this, she knew not the cause of the absence of her son. By the words she stated when she found him, did you not know that your father and I were looking for you? She had no idea, she had no idea of what was going on. She wasn't reproving our Lord. She wasn't chastising him. She was stating a, her bewilderment. Because heretics will say, well, she was, you know, chastising him, and that's just not true. But she only to expect him their grief in proceeding from this, from, you know, being separated from him because of the great love she bore for him, which she had experienced during his absence. The virtue she demonstrated during this sorrow was patience. Patience is different from long suffering. Well, actually, Longanity of soul is actually, longanity is the technical term. Longanity is the ability of this, uh, St. Thomas says, of the soul to await the good. You know, you can just remain in peace interiorly, even though you haven't received the good thing that you're trying to get. So the guy who's sitting at the stoplight um, very often will not have longanity of soul. You know, when is this light going to change? When is this light going to change? Then there's, so it's, it's awaiting the good, so the stress is on the side of the good. In, pa in patience, it's a different thing. With patience, what a person is actually dealing with, patience comes from the Latin word particularly, which means to suffer. So in, uh, patience is the virtue in which a person can suffer the evils with a certain equanimity of soul interiorly. You don't get disturbed by it. And Our Lady manifested perfect patience in this because of the fact that 
the separation was an evil that she was suffering. And she also had longanimity of soul. Even though she was pursuing him, she didn't, she grieved, she sorrowed, but she didn't get upset about it. This sorrow of Mary ought, in the first place, to serve as a consolation of those souls who are desolate and no longer enjoy, as they once did, the sweet presence of our Lord. Remember last night I was making the observation that one of the first things that God does to you in order to purify you and to test your will and to help you to grow in virtue is strip you of consolations. That's what it is. One time a seminarian came to me and he said, you know, before I came to the seminary, I used to love going to the church, I used to love going to Mass, he said, but ever since I've got here, it's just a drudgery. So I said to him, well, that's good. He was like, what? I said, because you have to get to the point where you're getting beyond that. You have to, you know, that's, it's a sign that you're not spiritually advanced enough that God has to constantly be giving you consolations. And this is the real danger of the charismatic renewal, by the way. And other spiritualities like that, where they think that, they, that when I feel good or get that consolation, they try and drum it up that somehow that God's approving me or that, you know, I get to experience God. That's not at all how God is experienced. St. John of the Cross says it's because of our imperfections that our experience of God is painful. And so people are trying to get that consolation and that's just a sign of spiritual imperfection. But our, neighbor, our lady never had that. And so we can look at her, you know, when she's going through this desolation of not having her son, that we can ask her, you know, help me to get through this, help me to have the same faith, the same charity, the same drive and constancy that you had. In the spiritual journey, as I mentioned, God strips us of this for our purification. The first thing that God does, again, in our spiritual life is strip us of this. It's a necessary process. Because if we don't, if he doesn't, we become attached to the consolations. And he is a jealous God. And by jealous we mean he will share your heart with nobody or no thing, period. And that means... He has to strip you of those things in order so that your attachments to those don't take that place in your heart. The most sorrowful mother can be petitioned to give you the motivation to be patient, therefore, in your suffering. In the fourth sorrow, Our Lady meets our Lord as He's going to death on the way of the cross. St. Bernadine says that to form an idea of greatness of Mary's grief in losing her uh, her son by death, we must consider the love that this mother bore to her son. All mothers feel the sufferings of their children as their own. It's part of empathy. It's actually um, a perfection that women actually have more so than men. I mean, men can empathize, but usually they're just like, oh, yeah, suck it up, you know, that kind of thing. Whereas women can empathize a bit more. As St. Richard of St. Lawrence writes, the most tenderly this mother loved so much more deeply was she wounded by seeing him. And that goes back to my observation that because of her perfect virtue and her acuity, acuity and because she loved him so much, her love was so strong, to see him in all the wounds made her suffer in a way that no one else did because she, her suffering was much deeper than ours. Although something needs to be said about woundedness. Our Lady wasn't wounded in the proper sense. Wounded means there's some kind of damage that occurs interiorly and the person is rendered weak as a result of it and they're, and they're in pain. And it requires a healing process. With Our Lady, she's in pain, so in that sense she's wounded. She's in pain, but she isn't damaged through this. Her virtue, her perfection remains constant through it all. And so that's why, we, in a proper sense, she wasn't wounded. But we can talk about her being wounded in the sense of the pain that she suffered in going through this. The greater her, was her love for, for him, the greater was her grief at the sight of his sufferings. And especially when she met her son, <clears throat> already condemned to death, and bearing his cross to the place of punishment. The Blessed Virgin revealed to St. Bridget that when the time of the Passion of our Lord was approaching, her eyes were always filled with tears as she thought of her beloved son whom she was about to lose on earth and that the prospect of that approaching suffering caused her to be seized with fear. Notice that she's going through the passion the same way Christ did. Christ had the agony of the garden. Her agony is in seeing her son and recognizing he's going to die. And a cold sweat covered her body. 
Behold, the appointed day at length came, and Jesus in tears went to leave, take leave of his mother before going to death. So she's going through the passion with him. In fact, she's so perfectly united with him through love, because one of the, the effects of love is union. She's so perfectly united with him through love, particularly charity, that each wound that he suffers, she does. Each blow that he suffers, she does. It's not just kind of this, oh, woe is me, look how bad this is. It's not it. Every single wound she suffers interiorly. Our Lady was a woman of perfect compassion. In seeing her son interiorly, she suffered every wound of his body. And there are three sorrows contained in this one sorrow. The first is the sorrow of Our Lady in seeing her son scourged, crowned with thorns, shedding his blood, carrying his cross, and knowledge that her son was on his way to death. She could see that. But then there is the sorrow of Jesus. Some saints tell us that Our Lady met him in tears. For Jesus, the suffering of the body pales in comparison to the suffering of seeing his mother share in his sufferings. That we'll talk about in the next sorrow. Of what he, when he saw her suffering, that was a much more intense form of suffering for him than the physical things he was going through because of his love for her. The, sorrow, the third is the sorrow of Our Lady in knowing that he suffers in seeing her suffer. You see that from time to time. You know, sometimes something really bad will happen, and it, you usually see it in the mother, right? where she doesn't want to let out that she's suffering and seeing her son leave because she doesn't want to make him sad that, you know, she's going through this. That's a common thing. The virtues Our Lady demonstrates in this sorrow is perfect surrender and resignation to the will of God. It doesn't matter what she is going through. Whatever God wants, that's what he gets. Extraordinary patience. Modesty and comportment and composure that we're going to talk about in the next sorrow. Perfect modesty, despite her agony, and then last, charity. That is, from compassion that arises from the unity of love. She suffered with her son. She, they often talk about her co-passion with her son, that she went through the passion with her son, because all the things that he went through, she went through interiorly. So we're starting to see that what she's going through is much more intense than what most of us, I think, would actually have really considered. And so in the next conference, we will take up the fifth sorrow. And we'll stop. There. In the fifth sorrow, our, lady, our Lord is um, crucified. That is, he's on the cross, and our Lady is there present with him. We now have witness to a new kind of martyrdom, a dry martyrdom. A mother is condemned to see an innocent son, one whom she loves with the whole affection of her soul, cruelly tormented and put to death before her own eyes. St. John, um, uh, the apostle, observes, There stood by the cross of Jesus his mother, and he believed that in those words he had said enough about Our Lady's martyrdom. Our Lady's martyrdom is actually more cruel and more suffering than any martyr that has ever suffered because it was the longest martyrdom ever suffered. The saints say that her martyrdom actually began with the first sorrow. So you're talking a woman who's 16, 17 years of age, maybe suffering all the way through until the seventh sorrow, and even, even after that, until his resurrection. <coughs> In this moment, which is the fulfillment of all prophecy in the Old Testament, it is this moment in which no mere creature, either having lived, living, or will live, would ever suffer the degree of suffering that Our Lady suffered. And I say mere creature, because Jesus was not a mere creature, because he was God and man. When you think of, of your own suffering and how bad it is, Regardless of how bad it is, you can always remember that Our Lady's suffering was far more worse than anything that you're going through, anything that you ever have suffered, anything that you ever will suffer. She is the mother of all consolation, therefore. Because she suffered the most, she becomes 
the mother of all consolation because, like a good mother, she consoles those who afflict. Like someone who has suffered, she has compassion on those who suffer. So that she actually, and because she has perfect charity, she has that compassion for us. And so she is the mother of all consolation. She stood beneath the cross in complete desolation. And so as a result, she merited the ability to console anybody. Our Lady had a threefold love for her son. The first is the instinctive and natural love a mother has for a son. The second is the natural love one person has for another in knowing how good they are and the experiences they, ha they have in, and how well they're treated by the person. So in other words, when you're around, you know, we just have, uh, well, there's certain people that when they treat us very well and they're, and they're not trying to just, you know, um, flatter us and that type of thing, but they're actually honest and they're treating us sincerely, that type of thing. We have a natural inclination in us as human beings to like, to like them and to love them. Our Lady was treated with tremendous love by her son, and so she could not help but love him back. In fact, this is something that I've learned as an exorcist. The love Christ has for Our Lady is unique. There is no other love like it. He loves her in a fundamentally different and an exalted way than he does the rest of us. In fact, because she has more grace than all of us combined, he actually loves us, or loves her more than everyone else combined. And it's distinct. There's very distinct aspects to it. He treats her in a fundamentally different way than he does anybody else. Then the third kind of love is charity. She knew how he was God and loved him with an entire immaculate heart. And we say immaculate. Our love is cold because of our imperfections, because of our woundedness, because of our sinfulness. She had none of that. There was nothing that would block her ability to love him completely. Also, his love for her was very distinct because of the fact that as God, he could see interiorly as he's hanging upon the cross what she went through. And yet she stayed there. He saw the goodness of that. But then she had to watch the executioner strip him of his clothes, pierce his hands and feet, pierce his heart, ridicule him. And yet through all of this she manifested perfect fidelity. For she stood at the foot of the cross even though most of the apostles and his friends had abandoned him. And yet one of her greatest sufferings was the fact that she could not console him. The natural inclination of a mother, women have a greater capacity for empathy than men. And so this is why, you know, you get a two-year-old and he runs along and he falls down and scrapes his knees and he starts crying and she picks him up and, you know, she suffers with him, right? And, you know, where there's a man, you just kind of like lift him up and say, okay, be a man and let's go. But the point is, is that in this particular case, she, and so the women have a much greater capacity to console. That's one of the perfections of women. Men have their own, but women have, that's one of them. And yet she couldn't do that. The inclination just on a natural level was unfulfilled. That's a suffering. <laughs> the fact that she, when we love people, we see them suffer, even if they're not our sons or daughters or what have you, and we want, they something, see something bad to them, we want to help them. She couldn't do that. The fact that she loved him with his whole heart, she couldn't do that. She could not console him because he had to. St he part of Christ's redemption was to hang upon the cross in utter desolation. Our Lord had the beatific vision his entire life, from the moment of his, his conception all the way to the death. He had the beatific vision. He saw God himself. Actually, he just saw he he actually saw his own divine nature in the in his humanity. But St. Thomas teaches us that on the cross, when he says, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He's not somehow doubting our Lord. That's just absolute heresy. What happens, St. Thomas says, is that there, when you see God face to face in the, in the intellect, there's a natural side on the side of the will, an immediate love, inclination to that, what you see, and delight. God blocked that natural effect 
that flows from the beatific vision in his will, and so Christ was left in complete desolation, even though he still had the beatific vision. Our Lady could not console him, and she had to suffer that. St. Thomas observes that Jesus manifested every virtue upon the cross. And it's true, if you, if you know all the virtues, you can go down them and see how each and every single one of them is manifested there. It's also true of the Mass, the Old Mass. And one of the difficulties with the New Mass, and I'm not trying to hack at it, is the fact that it lacks temperance and modesty and decorum, which you can ask me later about. But the Mass, since it's the... Um, representation of the sacrifice of Christ, you know, we're re, we're re present to the sacrifice of Calvary. All the virtues, if the ritual is properly conformed to that mystery, it all is manifest through the ritual. But this but Our Lady is the mirror of justice. And Jesus is justice itself. And in this sense, Our Lady was the mirror of every virtue that her son manifested. When she stood beneath the cross, she was manifesting Every single virtue. With respect to temperance, we see part of temperance is modesty. Modesty is the virtue by which you regulate your externals. Not just how you dress, but your comportment, your behavior, your speech, that type of thing. And Our Lady manifested perfect modesty by her comportment. She didn't run around with her head cut off like, what they're doing to my son, ah, you know, the histrionic thing. It's just not her. It's one of the reasons I'm always nervous about these apparitions where she's just like she wasn't that way in scripture and the ones we already know are authentic she's just like she shows up she says a few words and she's gone so part of modesty is humility St. Thomas says it's one of the sub virtues under modesty and humility is the virtue in which you do not judge yourself greater than you are and you're willing to live a life in accordance with truth that's the definition St. Thomas also defines it as not striving for an excellence that's beyond your state. She knew that she must stay there and carry this with Christ. It is what God asked of her. She knew this, this was her cross. This suffering was hers alone to carry. Just as Christ was alone on the cross, she was alone standing at the foot of the cross. Yes, St. John is there. Mary Magdalene, etc. But we all know you can be in a crowd of people and still be alone. And this is exactly what she's going through because her fix is totally on Christ and so she's completely desolate in looking at that. No one can carry this for her. She's the only one. She knew it was not her place to determine her sufferings. In other words, she wasn't proud. She, was, she didn't reject it. She didn't say, I don't think I should have to suffer this. It's not right. It's not right that my son should suffer this. She didn't, compl- you know, that kind of a thing. She just recognized, this is what God's asking me. Therefore, in humility, this is what I will do, and this is what I will accept. Behold the handmaid of the Lord, even at the foot of the cross. Whether she would or would not pick up the cross was not her place to determine. What God's will for her was not for her in her life. That is, it wasn't her place to determine those things. It was the will of God that she accompanied him in his passion so that she would be the co-redemptrix and the mediatrix of all grace. There was a reason why she had to stand there. So, temperance being, modesty being part of temperance, she manifested perfect temperance by perfect compartment and humility standing beneath the cross. She obviously manifested fortitude, a willingness to fall into battle is the definition of fortitude. This is spiritual warfare at its absolute height. It's the place in which the dominion of Satan is destroyed. And guess who's standing there? Is Our Lady. (laughs) She shall crush your head. Yeah, she will because she's standing at the foot of the cross. And this is one of the reasons why when she became Queen of Heaven and Earth, our Lord gave to her perfect coercive power over demons. She knows as an exercise except in so far as it's his will, but she has the capacity. She doesn't have to say anything. She just shows up, whew, out they go. What bravery and courage Our Lady had standing in front of all those people who ridiculed and jeered at Christ 
what bravery she had in him carrying in watching him carry such a heavy and painful cross. Most people would avoid suffering because it's so arduous and difficult, but she did not. At this point, she merited to be a battle array. She's a turret of force. You know, she's an army of one, as they say. One which the demons cannot resist. For from her compassion, again, as I mentioned, she has perfect coercive power over them. She, she manifested perfect justice. Justice is the virtue by which we render each person their due. Jesus is God, and therefore we must re always render to him what is due to him. Our Lady could not abandon him or betray him because that would have been unjust. This is part of justice's piety, and part of justice is the virtue of religion. She knew that she had to stand as an act of divine worship and self-sacrifice, sacrifice being the highest act of religion. She must stand there and sacrifice her very self with her son because of the union she has with him and because this is what he asked of her. Our Lord deserved to be accompanied through his passion to console him and to manifest our allegiance. But justice in scripture also means holiness. So the just man is the holy man. This moment was the source of all holiness for all mankind. For God, who is the source of all holiness, laid down his life so that we might have some participation in that holiness. Our Lady, who was immaculately conceived, full of grace, perfect in all virtue, was holy. And so she stood mirrored to her son, who is holiness itself, upon the cross. So you have holiness itself nailed to the cross, and the person who is perfectly holy beneath the cross. So there's this mirror that's occurring. She's the mirror of justice. Then, of course, there is prudence. Prudence is the virtue by which we know the means to attain the end. You just know the right thing to do in order to get what you need to get accomplished. The cross is the means of everyone's salvation, and Our Lady knew it. And it was also the means to fulfill, for her fulfillment, of the will of God. <coughs> Prudence also dictates that we take up the means which is the right means, regardless of how painful it is. And Our Lady embraced her own cross by standing underneath the cross of her son, since embracing her cross was the means to her becoming the queen of heaven and earth the mediatrix of all grace, which was the end God willed for her. This is why she is the virgin, virgin most prudent. She manifested perfect faith. The infused virtue of faith, the supernatural virtue of faith, is a virtue which God infuses in our intellects by which we are able to give assent to the truths that are revealed. Christ revealed that he would suffer and die, and she believed him. She believed God, her son, and would not abandon him. She also believed that he would rise on the third day. She had perfect hope. The infused virtue of hope is that by which we await the promises and the aid of God in attaining our salvation, or those things which he promises. Our Lady knew that her son was accomplishing everything necessary that would that we would need in order to reach our final end, that is to see God face to face and everything that he had promised. And it was also the means by which we're all aided by God to come about. In other words, it's the source of all grace, this moment. She believed and hoped her son even and hoped in her son even at the moment of his death. She did never, never doubt it. That business of people saying that she doubted is just <coughs> garbage. If you want to read a good book on that, there's a book by Sheban just called Mariology. He, he goes into why historically those who posit that are completely wrong. Then, of course, there is charity. The infused supernatural virtue of charity is that by which we love God and love our neighbor for the sake of God. And Our Lady manifested the love for her son, who is God, for love seeks union, and she would not leave the side of her son, despite how bad it got. And so we see this and we can, come, we can conclude that this is the moment, this moment is Our Lady's most glorious moment. 
It is not her most triumphant, for that is her entry into heaven. So when she entered into heaven, that was her most triumphant moment. And triumph, triumph is the, the celebration of the victory having been done. This isn't a celebration. Whereas when she, uh, that is standing at the foot of the cross, whereas when she entered into heaven, that was the celebration. All of heaven rejoiced in her entrance. It is not the moment of her greatest honor. For honor is praise or testimony to someone's excellence. And that moment came when God crowned her as heaven and earth, as a testimony to her perfection and her singular privileged role in history. Glory is the manifestation of excellence, not the honor given for it, but the manifestation that you show your excellence. St. Thomas observes that excellence for man consists in virtue. And this moment was the greatest manifestation of any virtue by any mere creature in the entire history of the world. It is Our Lady's and man's most glorious moment. In the sense that we, she, being the representation of the Church and of humanity, manifests that perfection, that moment. That it's her most glorious moment. We are told by the fathers of the church that Christ reversed the sin of Adam. For example, Adam took the fruit from the tree. Christ, who is Our Lady's first fruit, was put back on the tree. The crown of thorns that Christ suffered was in order to reverse the punishment due to Adam's sin in relationship to work, having to do among the midst of thorns, etc. You can go down the whole list. But the same is true of Our Lady in relationship to Eve. Cornelius Lapide who was one of the greatest commentators in Scripture in the entire history of the Church, not the greatest, but one of them, in reflecting on the fathers, observed that there were five sins that Eve committed when she ate the fruit. Now, so that women don't feel like they're getting beat up on, Adam committed eight. All right. The first, he says, is pride. The fathers, he's just compiling what the fathers say. They say is pride. Because she, Eve judged herself above the law of God. In other words, pride, which is the vice by which you judge yourself greater than yours. She, she, stood, she thought that she wasn't subject to the law of God. Our Lady, however, was the opposite. In humility, she stood beneath the cross and submitted herself to the suffering that God had asked her to carry. Just as Eve took the fruit from the tree in an act of pride, she stood, Our Lady stood beneath the tree in humility. The second that Eve committed is impatience and indignation of the soul because she was indignant to be constrained by the precept that she was not to eat of the fruit and she was warned off by the nobility of the fruit. In other words, she saw how noble and wonderful it is and so she was indignant that she was denied it. Our Lady is the opposite. She had perfect patience in seeing the fruit of her womb nailed to the tree of life and perfect detachment from self to follow the will of God even though she understood the nobility of her son. Her son was more noble than the fruit that Eve ate. And yet she allowed him. She didn't try and stop him to, you know, stop this, don't, don't go through this. She surrendered to it. The third sin that Eve committed was curiosity. <clears throat> now, curiosity is the vice by which we seek knowledge that's not proper to our state in life. The problem with curiosity in Adam and Eve, because Adam also committed, is in seeking the knowledge of good and evil. And that knowledge of good and evil is not... They already knew that evil, and that they could die if they ate this thing, they already knew that evil meant the absence of what good should be there, etc. They knew that. But what God forbid them is to have experiential knowledge of evil. That's the curiosity that they had, is what is this knowledge? And so, the fathers say that Eve had an elation, kind of a delight, a, a rising up in pride in seeing the fruit what would it be like to eat this? I often tell people that's why women can go and shop for long periods of time and never buy anything or you know, 
Because I can just look at him. Is that this wonderful? Which guys are like, let's get out of here. Yeah. This is the point of the fourth sorrow. She must look at the fruit of her womb and know in the brutality that is the sadness of the brutality and the suffering her son is undergoing rather than in curiosity and elation or delight. Do you see the point? Her knowledge, Our Lady's knowledge, is of the experiential pain of the evil that you never have committed. Whereas Eve's was a desire for knowledge and the elation in that maybe coming to knowledge of that. So there's that complete inversion. Then there is, the fourth sin is concupiscence of gluttony. That she ate the, she ate the thing. I mean, she shouldn't have eaten it. Concupiscence is a disordered appetite that arises contrary to reason. In other words, concupiscence is that inclination that we actually have from um, original sin which goes contrary to what we know we should and shouldn't, you know, that we know we should do. Our Lady, instead of eating out of a sinful desire, like Eve did in tasting the fruit, had to taste the bitterness of perfect desolation and detachment from her son. Instead of having the consolation and the delight that comes from fulfilling cupiscence, in, and where she would have had it if she would have tried to stop him and hold him and keep him from this happening to him, instead she allowed the fruit to be taken from her and put back on the tree. That is her son who is so good and the source of all delight and consolation. She had, Eve had perfect disobedience and transgression of the precept by actually eating the fruit. Our Lady, however, was perfectly obedient to the will of God by suffering the passion with her son. And so she, instead of eating, that is, filling herself interiorly with consolations and delight which we get from eating, she embraces her own interior crucifixion, her own interior death. In the sixth star, old Christ is taken down from the cross. During this sorrow, Christ is taken down and placed in the arms of his mother who embraces his broken, lacerated body. This embrace manifests perfect acceptance of her son's death. In every sacrifice, there are three things. The first is the offertory, that is, you offer the thing to God. The next is the slaying of the victim. That is, you kill the thing that's being sacrificed. And the third is that you consume it. This is what we know from the Old Testament. It's the structure that God set up in the Old Testament. And it continues. Even Christ suffered. Even the Mass is supposed to have those three elements. In Christ's sacrifice, the offertory was the agony in the garden. Not my will, but thine be done. And this is one of the reasons why I tell people, you know, you used to hear ridicule, you know, offered up. People, they would ridicule that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, what they're doing when they say offered up is they're calling you to sacrifice. They're calling you to an act of religion. To the slaying of the victim. This is the actual crucifixion of our Lord. And third, the consummation. You know, he says consummatum est. It is, it is cons consummated. The voluntary death upon the cross. So what he does is he allows himself to die. Mary's sacrifice has these three elements as well. <clears throat> in her offertory, we, she offered herself in the very beginning. She had voluntas to him. Let, you know, thy will be done. You know, will you be the mother of the Lord? You know, let thy will be done. It was at the beginning of her life and perdured throughout her entire life and she accepted the death of her son and offered herself to be slain with him by accompanying him in his passion. But also, as I mentioned before, she, in the fourth sorrow, she sees her son and there has to be renewal on her side of letting this happen, accepting her cross. There's an offertory of a sort being done there. In a certain sense, she's presenting herself to be slain with her son, so there's an offertory of a sort. 
Next is the slaying of the victim, watching her son being crucified. Our Lady's suffering is in tear that is in her heart, and her heart was crucified. It was pierced with her son. The third is the consummation. She watched her son be pierced, taken down from the cross, and she fully embraced his body. So she accepted it, the, the completion of it. At this moment, her sacrifice is complete, for she died with Christ interiorly. <coughs> you know, Mary is the most beautiful creature ever created. When she embraced Christ, he was bloody and sweaty, and so on a natural level, this doesn't appear very beautiful, right? But beauty has three components. It's an objective thing. When they say beauty is in the eye of the beholder, that's the biggest bunch of trash. The aesthetic sense is in the eye of the beholder. The beauty is in the thing. I always tell people, if you believe that, then why should you just find some guy, doesn't matter how ugly she is, just find some guy who thinks you're beautiful and you're fine. It's just not how it works. Women know that they have to do certain things to make themselves look beautiful. And that's a sign that by a natural human inclination, we know that it's objective. Right? So, the first is splendor, sometimes called clarity. It's when the beauty makes itself known. So a beautiful woman walks into the room, all the guys look and start watching her walk around. It's this clarity that naturally draws us the, to con contemplate the thing. God is perfectly beautiful as soon as you see him. Phew. One time Satan said he would be drugged up and down a barbed wire pole a thousand times just to gaze on the beauty of God for a second. Symmetry is the second one. There's two or more parts that are equal and balanced. See, you know, some person's face is like this. Well, you know it's not beautiful because it's not proportional. And then last is completeness or perfection. So if the person's missing their nose or something like that, well, they're not beautiful. Mary's beauty is perfectly manifest, not as to her physical beauty, even though she excelled in that, they say, but to her interior beauty for the following reasons. One, with respect to splendor. There is the manifestation of all her virtues of the cross and the effect of those virtues, which is the embracing of her son as he is taken down so that her virtue is shown to be perfect because of the fact that it is fully voluntary on her part by the embracing. In other words, this manifestation of the interior beauty of Our Lady, her virtues, her perfections, her grace, comes out in that moment. Two, the symmetry. Her suffering is complete at her son's suffering being complete. She manifested her perfect virtue so, she, uh, so as her son's son manifested perfect virtue. She died to herself as he died upon the cross. So there's this perfect symmetry between her and her son. And then last, completeness or perfection. Just as her son's suffering is completed by his death, so her suffering is complete by her own interior death. We can say, while this may not be the most beautiful moment in history on a physical level, it is the most beautiful moment on a spiritual level in history. The seventh sorrow, the burial of Jesus. When a mother is by the side of her suffering and dying child, she undoubtedly feels and suffers all his pain. But after he is actually dead, when, before the body is carried to the grave, the afflicted mother must bid her child a last farewell. You see that? Then indeed the thought that she is to see him no more is a grief which exceeds all other griefs. Behold the last sword of our, our lady's sorrow, which we can now consider. For after witnessing the death of her son on the cross and embracing for a last time his lifeless body, this blessed mother had to leave him in the sepulchre never more to enjoy his beloved presence on earth. St. Alphonsus observes that thus was Mary with her son locked in her arms, absorbed in grief. 
the holy disciples, fearful that the poor mother might die of grief, approached her to take the body of her son from her arms, to bear it away for burial. This they did with gentle and respectful violence. Now, by violence, we don't mean that our lady's like, no, don't take them, don't take That's not it. It's just the natural inclination of the mother to maintain that unity with her son, and so they had to take him from her, which is a violence to her interior soul, not in peeling her away from him, but in the, the violence that she has to undergo interiorly in relinquishing his body. And then embalmed it, and they wrapped it in a linen cloth, which was already prepared. On this cloth, which is still preserved in Turin, our Lord was pleased to leave the, word, the world an impression of his sacred body. The disciples then bore him to the tomb. To do this, they first of all raised the sacred body on their shoulders, and then the mournful train set forth. Choirs of angels from heaven accompanied it, St. Alphonse says. And the holy women followed, and with them the afflicted mother also followed by, followed her son, sorry, the mother, the afflicted mother followed her son to the place of burial. When they had reached the appointed place, St. Alphonse says, Oh, how willing would Mary have there buried herself alive with her son, had such been his will. And she revealed this, Our Lady revealed this actually to St. Bridget. The Blessed Mother, writes St. Fulgentius, would ardently have desired to have buried her soul with the body of Christ. And thus Mary herself revealed to St. Bridget, saying, I can truly say that at the burial of my son, one tomb contained, as it were, two hearts. Finally, the disciples raised the stone and closed up the Holy Sepulchre and in it the body of our Lord. This mother, saint, says St. Bernard, went away so afflicted and sad that she moved many to tears in spite of themselves. And wherever she passed, all who met her wept and could not restrain their tears. And he adds that the holy disciples and women who accompanied her mourned even more for her than for our Lord because of the tremendous suffering she underwent. Some saints say that Our Lady suffered so tremendously from, from the time in which he was placed in the tomb until the time in which he rose that our Lord deigned to come to comfort her before his rising. The difference at this stage between the completion and the sacrifice and the burial. In theology, we make a distinction between consummatum and finitum. And it's even in the Mass. You know, the priest, the consummatum Mass is, is when the priest consumes the host. But the finitum Mass is ite misa est. Go, it is completed, or it is accomplished, or it has been sent. In the old rite, we know that the, it's not, go, the Mass is ended. It's not it at all. It's, the ritual is complete. It, it has been sent. What's the, what's the it? Well, there's different levels of sacrifice. There's the Calvary sacrifice. There's the splitting of the, sacra the species sacramentally. That's one. And then the third is the completion of the ritual sacrifice. That's the ite misa asked. Go, it's been sent. The it is the sacrifice has been sent to God. And part of the reason we know this is because immediately after that, the word obfere, which means to offer, is now put in the past tense, where before in the Mass, it's always in the present tense, or in the future tense, up until that point. And also, during Lent, it used to be during the whole of Lent, but now in the 62, it's actually only for, um, the, uh, for the sacred triduum, the priest turns around and says, instead of eating this, benedictamus domino, and that's let us bless the Lord. In other words, the, the, the reason you don't say eating means to ask is because the sacrificing still continues all through Lent. And in this particular case, the 62, the sacrifice begins on Thursday and it ends on Sunday morning. So, in the relationship to Our Lady, the consummatum est is her Christ dying on our Lord and her dying with her on the Lord. But it's not over yet. It's not until he's buried that it's finished. So, as she's passing from the tomb, she knows it's done. It's finally finished. 
There is a common mistake from everybody today to think that Our Lady led a poster card life that was all hunky dory, joys and consolations, and wonderful and fairy tale, and etc. But no one ever suffered the way she did. If you are suffering, you need to go to her. If you're wounded, you need to go to her. Whether it is from your sin or the sins of others, because of the fact that she understands what it means to suffer from other people's sins. People's sins have put her son to death. Not her own, because she was sinless. But although the cross, the cross was the merit by which she was immaculately conceived, just applied back in time. And so you can go to her in your own sufferings because she knows how to consult because she went through it. There's a prayer by St. Bonaventure, and we'll end with this. Lady, who by thy sweetness doth ravage the hearts of men, hast thou not ravaged mine? O ravager of hearts, when wilt thou restore me mine? Rule and govern it with like thine own, preserve it in the blood of the Lamb and place it in thy son's side. Then shall I obtain what I desire, and possess what I hope for, for thou art our hope. And if you'll kneel, I'll give you a blessing. Benedictus Deum Nipotentis, Patris et Filii, Spiritus Supervos et Manet Semper. Amen.